It's about false and true worship. Shout out. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast but you do not see? Why humble ourselves but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. In such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself. I better read that again. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see them naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to live in. Before I start these scripture readings, I want to give you a little bit of context. Um, if you understand the way the book of Proverbs is written, most of it is not written in narrative form. Most of the book of Proverbs is a lot of like one line tips and thoughts. That's why some of those are there. The Psalms, I try to give you a little bit more context around there's one other reading from Deuteronomy and I think another reading from Isaiah. But I'm about to read to you 15 different scripture verses. Which is kind of a point I'm trying to make. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> let us let these words of God wash over us. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth and the sea and everything that's in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives hungry, or gives the food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he's frustrated. He, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. The rights of all who are destitute, speak up. 
and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Do not withhold good from those who it is due. When it's your power to act, do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow, and I'll give it to you, when you already have it with you. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth, and he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heaps and sets them with the princes, with the princes of his people. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Those who give the poor lack nothing, give to the poor lack nothing, but those who close their eyes receive many curses. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people and the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice. Take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. With my mouth, I, greet, I greatly extol the Lord. At the great throng of worshipers, I praise him, for he stands at the right hand of the needy and he saves their lives from those who would condemn them. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from the oppressed and the violence, for the precious, for precious is their blood in his sight. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. And lastly, learn to do what is right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. These are the words of our Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, be with us in this time. I pray that you would help us to see your word and not our divisions. You would help us to understand what it is to be righteous people, to promote justice in society, to encourage and lift up your people. Pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Woo! It's a lot of reading for this dyslexic. How are you doing? Doing good. Okay. This is uh, well, almost one of the last of our sermon series on the great ends of the church. And this great end of the church is the promotion of social righteousness. The promotion of social righteousness. Now I want to make a point here early in the beginning because we live in a divided society. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks behind me. And I want to point out that as churches, we haven't, uh, as a church, we have not always agreed about the way to go about things. 
and especially the philosophy of how to deal with social change. Our church split over this idea, but one of the things, just so that you know how like highbrow some of this was, one of the things that we split over was whether or not there should be an organ in worship. <laughs> because it was too emotional of an instrument and a ruckus, a ruckus for worship. Oh, I thought she was playing it. There she goes. Okay. Um, so, I'm, I'm distracted by the phone. It's, it's a ruckus. No. Um, so, this was part of, I mean, I'm trying to show you, like, we, we can fight over anything. Yeah? Okay. Now we still fight about the organ, but it's like whether to keep it in or not. So, early in the church, especially around the time of the Industrial Revolution, there became a lot of problems that came with the Industrial Revolution that the church never had to deal with before. When we were an agricultural society, we did not have all of the, necessarily all of the struggles that came with the Industrial Revolution. Some of which came with that was drunkenness. There was an increase in drunkenness, which led to the prohibition. Okay? There was an increase in social systems that created poverty. People were living in a different kind of environment at that time. I mean, there, there was a lot of things that started happening, and the church had to decide how they wanted to deal with it. And there were kind of two schools, okay? And these schools still exist today in the church. The first school is if people are righteous and moral within themselves, and we teach everyone to be righteous and moral, society will become righteous and moral. Yes? You've heard this? Okay. This is where the prohibition comes from. This is, this is that concept, okay? If we, if we ban it, or the Puritans would have lived in this camp. If we create a society that's focused on our goodness, then when Jesus comes, we're ready. Okay? The other camp is the, we have to do something as a church about the system, it's not just our personal generosity or our personal experience, but a corporate experience. As a people, we have to be involved in the system to make the transformation of preparing for the kingdom to come now. Okay? One is about awaiting and one is about now. One is about personal, one is about corporate. Yes? You see these things? You know people in your life, at least two people in your life, that land in these different camps. Hands up if you know these people. Okay? We have them in my family, both sides. And it spawns great arguments. That come out of faithful places. I want, I want you to hear me telling you that these are these are pers these are responses that come from scripture. But the promotion of social righteousness is something that we are instructed in the great ends to do. Now, if you 
don't know by now, I'm going to just go ahead and expose myself. I'm kind of a corporate social systems person. Okay? That there, there are things that we need to be about, but I also deeply believe that it's about our personal journey that gets us there. For some reason, we've decided these things are separate. They are not separate. These are two sides to the same coin. Because if you do all the deeds and all the things, and your heart is not pointed towards God, you can make all the change in the world that you're not bringing about the kingdom. With me? Same goes the other way. Me and Jesus can sit up on a mountain and have a great relationship, but I and I can be the most moral and upright human being. I can be Job level good. And it doesn't do a thing unless that moves me. Faith without works is dead. Unless it moves me to be about something. So, our job, we, we, had, we had the one, the spiritual nurture one. Yes? This great end of the church is not about that. This is about the other thing. This is about the doing thing. This is about the making changes thing. And so I really want you to think about one of the things that is really important to God's heart that just came out of that slew of readings. There were several things that came up a bunch of times. What are they? Help the needy. Feed the hungry. Care for the poor. Take care of the widow. Speak for the oppressed. Take care of the widow. Take care of the widow and the orphan. What else did you hear? Those are the big ones. The fatherless. The foreigner. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Poor, hungry, widow, orphan, fatherless, needy, foreigner, oppressed. Prisoner. Prisoner. These things come up over and over and over and over and over again. The passage that Annie read is about we, the people of Israel, are worshiping. They're in a season of fast, but they're not doing anything for anybody else. And God responds with, why? Why, why do this? if you're not gonna change the world. God called Israel out of slavery and oppression to be a chosen people to bless others. That's their call. Their call was not to end up on top. Their call was to bless others. And so I want you to take one of these things, okay, just one of them, and know which one of those things your heart is about. For me, personally, it makes me sick that people are hungry. Sick. I'm doing it 
a decluttering thing this year? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Woo! Guess how awful I felt when I got to my pantry <laughs> and I threw away a garbage can full of expired food that just sat there. Sick. And I'm about that. Do you know what I mean? We had somebody who, who <coughs> introduced our congregation to the human trafficking epidemic. Maybe you're about that. Maybe it's about the fact that people have to sell their bodies. To make it or they're trapped and oppressed in it. Maybe it's that people are cold. There are people who are sleeping outside. They don't have a home. And it's snowing. Or not snowing wherever they live. So pick one of these things. And make Make it, make it your heart. Make it attached to your personal faith. This is a great suggestion that was given to me. When I was at General Assembly, there were homeless people everywhere. And between my hotel and the assembly, every day, I was hit up at least five, ten times. And I bought a bunch of granola bars and stuck them in my purse. And that was what I decided I was going to do. Right? Because I told you, hunger is a problem for me. And my EP, Sarah Marnos, when I told her about this, there was just all kinds of things that were happening. A woman approached me who had an infant it was the middle of the night, asked me if I could get her a hotel room. And I had to walk away from her and go and sleep in a cushy hotel paid for. Because I had been pieced apart that day. So that's the other thing. When you dive into social righteousness and promoting it, you can get torn apart. And it was Sarah who said to me, Rose, you've got to pick one thing that you're about and work really hard for the kingdom to be in that thing. Especially at that particular event. That was what I needed. Because I was getting picked apart and I couldn't make good had, it was emotional. It was just a wreck. You know what I mean? Have you experienced these things? Were you just like so overwhelmed by the need of the world? So I encourage you to pick something that you can be about, connect it to your faith, and know that that thing is a thing that's on God's heart. And as a church, if every single one of you in this room start working slowly but surely for justice in that area, we will change the world. Amen?